Can we start a live stream, please? Oh, thank you. Uh, Sergeants, uh, will you start the recording? Recording to the computer or set. Recording to the cloud started. Sergeant Sadowski, you may begin with your opening statement. Yep, thank you. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Transportation. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Thank you, Silence, and good morning, and welcome, everyone, to the City Council Transportation Committee's hearing on the fiscal 2022 preliminary budget and fiscal 2021 preliminary measures management report. My name is Idani Rodriguez, and I have the privilege of chairing this committee. Before I get into the matter that we will be discussing on this budget today, I would like to say a few words in regards to the announcement that Mayor de Blasio made on reference to some financial support to medallion, taxi medallion owner in the city of New York. Everyone know that I am, and I have been one of the probably few council members that have always stayed giving all the credit to this administration. And as someone that served with previous administration and current administration, we have seen the difference of things that have happened, things that we have accomplished under Mayor de Blasio's uh, leadership, things that we had never thought that we would be able to accomplish before. UPK, computer for all, criminal justice reform, uh, more support to the small businesses, uh, helping uh, tenants building affordable housing. But I think that the announcement today should be seen only as a beginning to share, and we were here from the TSC Commission that later on, that the, with the millions of dollars, the $65 million that will be invested to help the yellow taxi medallion, it will alleviate the crisis. The answer is no. And I hope to continue working with my colleague especially, you know, the speaker, but most important also with our friend, Bill de Blasio and his team, to increase that commitment. $20,000 will not help someone that have a debt of $400,000. I think that there's a plan already presented that came out from the Yellow Taxi Medallion Task Force that allow, will allow a medallion owners, but especially, you know, the individual medallion owners, 6,000 of them to redefine the debt. We need to do it. We cannot take the input yet from the lender, lenders or the brokers. We need to take the input and work, especially with the individual medallion owners. So again, I hope that we can continue conversation with and the mayor's team to look at this number. This number cannot and will not bring the solution to the crisis or thousands of medallions that they park in the garage or drivers that they are not making the living. So hopefully we can continue addressing this matter. Today, we are here to begin the fiscal 2022 budget process under very different circumstances than when we met last year, tragically, Nearly 30,000 New Yorkers have died due to the coronavirus and the lives of all New Yorkers have been drastically altered by the spread of the virus. And everyone know, we don't want a single New Yorker to die, but most people who died, they were working class New Yorkers that didn't have the privilege to do an isolation in the home turn of the Hobson Valley. Families have been separated. Jobs have been lost. Local business have been forced to shutter and virus has laid bare many long-standing social injustice 
that have existed for decades. With the development of three vaccines, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. However, as we are able to begin to return to a sense of normalcy, normalcy we must ensure that vaccine distribution is equitable and that inequality does not grow. And that we also focus on brief health conditions that affect mainly Black, Latino, Asian, and working other poor New Yorkers. I would like to thank the city's essential workers, many of whom are from underserved minority communities. Without their work, our city would not be able to function. Thanks to their dedication and sacrifice, our trains and buses have continued to run. Our cops are able to drive medical staff to hospitals and deliver food to the needed. Our grocery store remains in stock and our nurses and our doctors have been able to save lives. However, far too many workers have passed away, including more than 100 transit workers. I would like to take a moment of silence to recognize and honor the sacrifice of all these workers, as well as the 30,000 New Yorkers who have fallen to the virus. Thank you. Through today's hearing, we hope, this, we hope the start of the budget process will lead to the adoption of a budget that is progressive, responsible, and fair to all New Yorkers, especially the poorest one, the one that gave the victory to this administration when he got the mandate to close the gap between the poor and the rich. A budget we also hope will effectively meet the city's need while hoping to lead it, to lead it through this pandemic. We will start by hearing testimony from the city department for transportation. Following the DOT, following the DOT, we will hear from the Tax and Limousine Commission. Unlike in the past, we will be conducting our hearing with the MTA on a different day due to the scheduling difficulty. And of course, this day should be happening in the next two weeks. The DOT's executive expense budget for fiscal 2022 is approximately 1.1 billion. In addition, 10.4 billion is budgeted for the department's capital program. We look forward to the commissioner updating the, co the, the committee on the department's effort to maintain and improve pedestrian safety and the city's roadway infrastructure during this pandemic. Additionally, we hope the department will discuss its four-year capital plan, particularly in terms of its goals and priorities once we recover from this pandemic and its strategy to resume any projects that have been halted. Finally, the mayor has announced that the open restaurant program will become a permanent feature in New York City. We look forward to hearing how DOT plans to continue this program and how it will be carried out equitable to all community businesses in need of additional space, especially targeting those communities that suffer the most, that have the high numbers of the resident with COVID and dying as a result of the COVID. Finally, after we hear from DOT, we will hear from the Taxi Limousine Commission at their report on the industry that has been devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Tragically, there was a 66% decline in the number of drivers on the street in December 2020, when compared to 2019 before the pandemic. TLC's proposed fiscal 2022 preliminary budget is 54.7 million. The committee hopes to hear from the commission on the effect of COVID-19 on the taxi industry and how the commission is hoping to protect drivers from the effect in coronavirus and how we plan to help the industry recover, especially how they will be helping delivery taxi bases in local community that sometimes doesn't get to get the same connection as Uber and Lyft. Next, the committee anticipates 
hearing about how the commission is following through with the council's legislation to help provide a struggling taxi cab drivers with financial help and mental services. Before, uh, I would now ask the committee council to go over some procedure items and swear in the team from DOT. And before that, uh, if it's possible, also recognize the council members that have already joined us. Thank you, Chair. I'm Elliot Lynn, Council of the Transportation Committee of the New York City Council. Um, we have been joined by Council Members Deutsch, Diaz, Minchaka, Riley, Rose, Miller, Lander, Holden, Cabrera, and Ku. Um, before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify, when you will be, then be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in, in order. Unless otherwise indicated by the chair, we will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including answers. This hearing will be divided into three sections, as the chair mentioned. Um, uh, first, we'll hear from the Department of Transportation, followed by the TLC around 1 p.m. And finally, members of the public around 2 p.m. Um, I will now call on our first okay. panelist from the Department of Transportation. Um, Commissioner Hank Gutman, Executive Deputy Commissioner Joseph Jarin, and Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zack. I will read, now read the affirmation and then call on each of you to confirm your response aloud for the record. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Gutman. Sorry, I do. Deputy Commissioner Jaron. I do. Assistant Commissioner Zach. I do. Thank you. You may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, Chair Rodriguez and Chair Rosenthal and members of the Transportation Committee and the Subcommittee on Capital Budget. I'm Hank Gutman. I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation. With me today are Joseph Jaron, our Executive Deputy Commissioner, and Rebecca Zach, the Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs. Thank you for inviting us to testify on behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio on the DOT's fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget and the fiscal year 21 to 31 capital plan. I'm honored to have the opportunity to serve as the DOT's commissioner during this unprecedented moment in our city's history. The DOT's work, it's no exaggeration to say that the DOT's work touches every aspect of life in the city and is essential to the city's recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. In this final year of the de Blasio administration, we at DOT will help New Yorkers return to work safely, receive our goods efficiently, and enjoy access to more open space. And to do all of that in an equitable fashion, as the chair pointed out. I look forward to working with you, Chair Rodriguez, and the entire committee and the entire council on our urgent work to build a recovery for all of us, focused on safety, equity, sustainability, and resilience. Today I'm testifying on a budget that reflects the extraordinary challenges we face as a city and the countless ways the COVID-19 crisis has changed our lives since the agency's preliminary budget hearing one year ago today. In the years since, the DOT and the rest of our sister agencies have felt the impact of the virus directly on both our operations and our budgets. And of course, on a more important level, all New Yorkers have experienced the effect of the pandemic on our health and welfare and our lives. During this difficult year, DOT employees fell ill, had to quarantine, and sadly, some in our ranks were lost forever. We mourn the loss of colleagues at the DOT, along with other frontline, all other frontline city agencies and the MTA, and we're grateful to all the essential workers who put their lives at risk each and every day. 
The DOT in response to the pandemic also transitioned many of our staff to teleworking, redesigned all our major operations for the COVID era, and worked closely with our union partners to ensure that the workforce remained socially distanced, well-equipped, and fully supported. The DOT also faced significant fiscal challenges due to the pandemic that will continue to impact our work this year and in the years to come. As the mayor has said, the economic fallout caused by the pandemic hit the city budget hard. The city's lost $10.5 billion in projected tax revenue from fiscal year 20 to 22, and we're in the midst of a hiring freeze. But despite the many operational and fiscal challenges posed by the pandemic, the women and men of DOT have performed, have performed remarkably well. As I said when the mayor appointed me, the Department of Transportation just completed one of the most challenge challenging, transformative, and productive years in its history. I made a mistake on that day and referred to it as the Department of Transport Transformation rather than Transportation which the mayor picked on. Having been here for a month now, I can say it was no mistake. This is the Department of Transformation. Even during the worst days of the crisis, the agency continued its essential functions, making infrastructure repairs, running the Staten Island Ferry 24 seven, to combat a national trend in increased speeding as roadways emptied during the pandemic, the DOT continued to expand the speed camera program installing more speed cameras in 2020 than in the first six years of the program combined, with now over 1,200 speed cameras active across 750 school speed zones citywide. The DOT also responded to the needs of the moment, working hard to provide reliable and safe alternative modes of travel for New Yorkers, especially the essential workers who could not work from home. The agency installed its highest number ever of new protected bike lanes, 28.9 miles, to enhance cyclist safety as more New Yorkers were choosing to bike. And it installed a record number of new bus lanes, 16.3 miles, to shorten commute time for bus riders, many of whom are essential workers. Working in partnership with Lyft, the DOT expanded the city bike network into Upper Manta Manhattan and the South Bronx with locations at multiple medical facilities. The system now has over 20,000 bikes and nearly 1,300 stations, more than double the size of the system at its launch in 2013. And City Bikes Critical Worker Membership Program has provided more than 960,000, almost a million, free City Bike rides to over 19,200 critical workers to date. Under the mayor's leadership and in partnership with the council and other city agencies, DOT created multiple new programs to reimagine our streets in response to the pandemic. Answering the calls from many of you on the council and New Yorkers at large, the DOT created 83 miles of open streets, 83. This program is the largest in the nation and it gave New Yorkers space to socially distance and safely get outside during the pandemic. The DOT launched the Open Restaurants Program through which over 11,000 restaurants were able to set up outdoors on the city's roadways and sidewalks while indoor dining was banned or limited. This popular program supported the city's beloved, I would say unique, restaurant industry and saved over 100,000 jobs. The DOT also established the open storefronts program and allowing businesses to use space outside to conduct business and keep customers safe as they shopped. The agency also allowed schools to use additional outdoor space to keep our kids safe through the outdoor learning program. And starting this month, thanks to the council's leadership, Art and cultural groups will begin holding events on designated streets through the Open Culture Program. Together, these programs have brought New Yorkers much needed joy and relief and respite during this difficult time. 
And again, it's no exaggeration to say that we have been transforming the streets of this city and how we use them. So now we turn to recovery. Some of these historic changes to our streets, we intend to make permanent fixtures in our city. As the mayor announced and the council codified in Local Law 114 of 2020, we are working to design the legal and operational structure for a permanent open, permanent open restaurants program with a goal of having it in place before the end of this year. That is before the end of this year, before the mayor's term is, has expired and mine. This budget provides critical funding for the permanent program's environmental review. And the mayor's state of the city address set the table for an even more ambitious year to come. As the mayor announced, we are creating a permanent open streets program. This year, many of the open streets from 2020 will return and we will open applications for new streets with a focus on local partner management and support, as well as equity and inclusion. We will also continue to prioritize accessibility and work towards creating a more accessible city for all. The mayor believes, and I strongly concur, that if you give people more and more attractive alternatives to the car culture, they will use them. And we will continue to support the increased number of New Yorkers traveling around the city by bike. As the mayor announced, we are creating bridges for the people, which will offer expanded cycling infrastructure on the iconic Brooklyn and Queensboro bridges. We will install five new bike boulevards across the city. Streets designed to give bicycles travel priority and to put cyclist safety first. And as the chair knows, on my first day as commissioner, the mayor and I committed to installing 10,000 new bike parking racks by the end of 2022. 10,000 racks providing 20,000 additional bike parking spaces citywide. And it was both an honor and a privilege to have the chair join us in the Bronx uh, last Friday up on Pelham Parkway as we unveiled some of the first of those newly installed racks. And as I said at the time, those were six racks, but they were symbolic of the more than 300 that were installed simultaneously during the week all over the city. To build a more equitable recovery, as the mayor announced, we will create new public spaces in more than 30 of the neighborhoods hit hardest by COVID-19. These spaces will help support small, small local businesses, foster community ties, provide space for arts and culture, and enhance roadway safety. We will also continue expanding micro-mobility options deeper into the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens, including to more low-income communities and communities of color. In partnership with Lyft, we will expand City Bike further into the Bronx, Astoria, Sunset Park, and Upper Manhattan, covering the entire Met borough of Manhattan by the end of the year. And under the leadership of the council, we are launching an e-scooter pilot in the Eastern Bronx neighborhoods from East Chester and Co-op City to Throgs Neck and Soundview this spring, bringing this new mode of transportation, which has been popular and successful in various other cities, to an 18 square mile area home to over 570,000 residents. This budget reflects the costs for the pilot's administrative needs and projected, as well as the projected revenue from the pilot. And while 2020 was a difficult year for Vision Zero, there were encouraging signs, including a record low number of pedestrian deaths on New York City streets. For the first time since records began, fewer than 100 pedestrians were killed. Obviously, one is too many, um, but this was one relative bright spot in an otherwise challenging year. Unfortunately, reckless behaviors such as speeding and unlicensed operation led to an increase in the number of motorcyclists and motor vehicle occupants killed in 2020. This year, we will double down on our efforts to enhance street safety and public outreach, and we will follow the data to make the city street safer. We will continue to install record numbers of bike lanes and bus lanes, and we will pursue state authorization to keep our life-saving speed cameras on 24 seven. 
critically important. Together, this urgent work will help our great city come back from this terrible crisis better than ever. We are thankful for the council's ongoing partnership. And I must say on a personal level, I look forward to it going forward this year as we work towards a recovery, as the mayor says, a recovery for all of us. Uh, now I'll give a, a brief overview of the DOT's proposed 1.1 billion expense budget as well as our proposed 19.7 billion fiscal years 21 to 31 capital plan and discuss how we found savings to ensure we can continue meeting our mission and following through on our urgent work. Starting with the expense budget, the 1.1 billion expense budget includes, and there's a pie chart, pie chart in my testimony if you find it easier to follow along there, uh, the 1.1 billion includes 364 million for traffic operations, including signals, streetlights, and parking. 196 million for roadway maintenance. 108 million for bridge maintenance and inspection. 119 million for transportation planning and management, including installation of street signs and roadway markings. 98 million for ferry operations and maintenance and 247 million for other DOT operations and administration, including sidewalk management and inspection. The proposed 19.7 billion fiscal year 21 to 31 capital plan includes 10.2 billion for bridge reconstruction and rehabilitation, 3.6 billion for street reconstruction, 1.8 billion for resurfacing, 2.3 billion for sidewalk and pedestrian ramp repair and reconstruction, 487 million for the Staten Island Ferry, 871 million for streetlights and signals, and 538 million for the facilities and equipment needed to support the DOT's operations. I also wanna provide some additional context about our budget and how we were able to identify savings uh, as Commissioner Trottenberg testified last year. While the DOT's operating budget is 1.1 billion, over 50% of that comes from state and federal grants, the capital budget known as IFA funds and funds that support revenue generating programs, that is funds spent to generate funds such as parking meter operations and automated traffic enforcement. Again, the pie chart included in my printed testimony gives you a graphic demonstration of the point. Thus making cuts in these parts of the budget wouldn't generate expense budget savings. Of the approximately 480 million remaining, large portions are relatively fixed costs, such as the electric bill for street lights and signals and the leases on DOT facilities, or support the inspection and maintenance of the essential infrastructure on which all street users rely and which it's our obligation to keep us safe. You can find additional information about how we use our city tax levy funds in the next chart on page 12 of my printed testimony which again shows the breakdown. To respond to the economic fallout from the pandemic since the April 2020 financial plan, the DOT has found targeted savings of over 125 million in fiscal years 21 and 22. Many marquee DOT programs had to sustain cuts, including sadly vision zero where we identified 7 million in savings for fiscal year 21 and 22 with items such as reduced spending on roadway markings due to current contractor capacity, reduced media spending, and a delay in filling some of the uh, employment positions. While we do not take these savings lightly with a total of 2 billion spent on vision zero thus far, and total investment of 3 billion by this administration, our commitment to eliminating traffic fatalities and serious injuries remains steadfast. I mean, safety is our top priority on this and everything else. 
We had to take a hard look at our budget and prioritize identifying planned safe plan spending that while important could be delayed. And though the pandemic added a variety of new operational costs, it also led to some savings. In the preliminary budget, nearly 12 million of OTPS funding reductions were taken in fiscal year 21 and 22 for items such as delays to the drainage study with the DEP and savings from reduced telephone and printer usage, as well as 6 million in fiscal year 21 savings due to hiring delays and attrition. Additionally, given the success of the city bike program and surges in ridership, we realized over $500,000 more than originally expected in revenue for fiscal year 21. For, fiscal, for DOT's capital budget, we rolled out over 1 billion from the 21 to 24 period into the 25 to 31 period. This is largely comprised of funding for the streets and bridges programs while keeping funds available for critical near-term work. Now to the capital plan. As we work towards recovery, I'm happy to say that the mayor announced last week that the city is restarting 17 billion in major capital projects, including a significant number of DOT projects. These projects will build the future of this city and improve the lives of New Yorkers for generations to come. Again, the Department of Transformation. We are eager to restart some of our projects and to continue our work on others. This year, the DOT is funded for 910 lane miles of roadway resurfacing, continuing our sixth straight year of record investment in the roads. And we continue to work with our contractors and partners at DDC on our most critical capital projects. These include streetscape improvements by the Rockaway Ferry and one of the most critical segments of the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway, creating a safe separated bike path connecting Sunset Park to Red Hook and Gowanus via, the, via Hamilton Avenue. We also expect to begin construction on the next phase of our Atlantic Avenue Great Streets project which will continue important safety improvements along the corridor and introduce protected bike paths along a new planted median. We will also be cons begin construction on the West 79th Street Rotunda Complex and 79th Street Bridge over Amtrak in Manhattan this year, a complex project that includes rehabilitating seven bridge structures, the landmark rotunda itself, and more. And we are continuing other essential bridge work including upcoming repairs on the BQE, as well as continuing monitoring and planning for maintaining a state of good repair along that entire corridor. And by the way, I should add, we are also looking at other bridge structures in need of repair. The BQE is, is a prominent example, but it is certainly not the only one in the city. Conclusion. While we face significant fiscal and operational challenges due to the pandemic, I'm confident that DOT's creative and resourceful workforce will make the most of our robust resources. We will continue to maintain and improve our infrastructure, manage the city streets and run the Staten Island Ferry. And we will continue implementing transformational pedestrian, bike, bus, and safety projects that will support the city's recovery and improve the quality of life of New Yorkers for years to come. And if, my be, if I may be allowed one personal note, in my month as commissioner of the DOT, I wanna say that this is the most extraordinary collection of women and men I've ever had the privilege to work for. They are smart, they are dedicated, they are committed to making life better for all New Yorkers, and I am proud to be associated with this department and being put in a position where I can work with this extraordinary group of people. So I would like to thank the council for the opportunity to testify you before you today, and I look forward to working with all of you in this final year of the de Blasio administration to recate to create a recovery for all of us and to help this great city come back better than ever. I'm, I would now be happy to answer any of your questions. 
Thank you, Commissioner. It's been also a great honor to connect with you, to be able to share a lot of good ideas and big goals that we all have to make our city the most pedestrian and cycling friendly in the whole nation. And I know that, you know, having great conversation with you and being, as you said, a, in the press conference in the Bronx, I know that we have a lot of work to do in, ahead of us in the next couple of months. So, Thank you for your service and your preview job that you have. And, you know, welcome again, again to this year and hoping to continue working with you. And as you say, with the great team that you have. Uh, the, uh, I have a few questions. Yes. Uh, what the first one is related to a uh, mobilize during COVID-19 recovery. Uh, can you speak on... Okay. How the polls ordered by the state governor and the mayor impact DOT project? Sure. Um, we, we had a number of projects uh, that we had to put on hold. I mean, the effort was not to put on hold things that were time sensitive and critical, but there were a lot of projects where planning was delayed, execution was delayed, and as I said in my testimony, this is something that we're looking forward to coming back to full force now. Uh, the mayor has given the word to put on our track shoes. We've got an aggressive list of, of uh, commitments to meet by the end of the year. And now that the pause is over, we're determined to get there. How has the OT been able to mobilize to ensure that key infrastructure project as well as the important council initiative such as the transportation master plan get complete. Absolutely. Well, with respect to the with respect to the master plan, the agenda for this year uh, is to come up with the plan to get that done, and we have the team working on that, and we we are ready to, and we will meet that commitment. That is something we take very seriously, and we will get it done. Okay, and as you say that. DOT has been able to start a, a, a taking back on many projects that they were post as a result of, of 20 of the COVID-19. And you address a, your commitment or the, the agency commitment also to work on our bridge, which is the bridge, the bridge that we have, the three bridges that you say, that you can say that they are in worse condition as we speak now and the one that need more attention. Um, uh, uh, Chair Rodriguez, you, you were breaking up some in, in the transmission, but I think you asked uh, what, what bridges, I mean. Bridges in worse condition uh, that we have today in New York City. So. Uh, bridges being able to get the attention, the investment. Reporting. So we are we are in the process. I have asked, uh, I have asked, uh, uh, I have asked our bridges group uh, to come up with uh, bridges other than the BQE, the BQE, which is a series of bridges in relevant parts that we know about and that we're working on. Uh, but I've asked our bridges group to come up with an identification of other bridges. Uh, that require attention, and um, I am awaiting the response. But we will certainly keep you informed. And again, this is a priority. We need to identify the bridges that require our attention, um, and we will certainly keep keep you as chair and the committee advised on that. Okay, and if it's possible, so I would like for you to get your team to look at the two hundred seven bridge in my district uptown and not necessarily i don't know again what is the condition of the bridge but i know that we major returning uh, that thanks god the state law gave the okay but uh, to go ahead and make your project are ahead of us including a big one uh, in one four seven bridge and that bridge again i don't know about the condition but i know that the bridge is narrow it's spawned so the numbers of units that we have, we have in the Manhattan side, yep. and the 207 bridge 
connecting Manhattan and the Bronx, shooting in one day condition, and it is possible to include a bridge in a line where we need to build a new one that will be much wider than the narrow one that we have today. I took uh, note. Yeah, Chair, Chair Rodriguez, we will make sure that, that, is, that that's on the list that we look at and, and uh, we'll be in touch. Okay. Now on Vision Zero, yes. uh, the Zero Public Awareness Campaign funding that we came together and the council, again, was able to persuade the administration to invest, a, put like $5 million for the Vision Zero outreach campaign. And what we include a reduction of $2 million for Vision Zero outreach campaign in fiscal 2022. What is the current level of Vision Zero public awareness funding in the outreach? Yeah, let, let me find those those numbers for you. And uh, uh, it's interesting that you raise that issue. Um, we are having active conversations within the agency as recently as this morning about what we might be able to do. Mr. Jaron's shaking his head because he and I had the conversation. Uh, what we might be able to do uh, to find a saving somewhere else so that we can restore that funding. Um, the, the current uh, media public awareness funding for fiscal year 2022 is uh, 3 million. And starting in fiscal year 2023, uh, the baseline will be 5 million. Um, but if the chair's point is that this is critically important in terms of safety uh, and an important component of anything we're doing in that regard, I personally agree completely. And we're gonna see what we can do to, to try and restore some of that funding. Um, Again, it was the challenge of COVID and trying to come up with the savings that were required, but this is clearly an important item. I don't think that, being honest with you, I don't think it's because of the COVID. This is like one of those lines that we will assume that City Hall should be leading that effort to invest in that, in the outreach initiative and every year. And we at the council have been the one that has to be fighting to restore this funding. So, and, and, and this is like the budget dancing cycle. Here yep. we hoping that we negotiate and we happy celebrate that we got some. So I think that, that we understand that piece and that's part of our culture in New York City. But I also hope that Vim Vision Zero, one of the most important uh, policy of this administration that we should not be waiting for the next hearing on this budget to a uh, for the for city hall to wait for us to keep pushing. This is something that don't, they should immediately, you know, that's my suggestion, get the additional money to complete uh, uh, the budget uh, as at least as equal as it was uh, for the one that we will be finished doing. And Commissioner, can you, and again, I don't know if you have that information with you, but if you don't have any, you think it shall later on, can you provide us with a breakdown of the outreach funding specifically for media buys and how that media buys also have include any media? Sure. Uh, I can certainly, uh, I can certainly get you, get you that breakdown. Uh, uh, I have, I have a partial breakdown here, but let me get you more complete numbers on that. Um, I can follow up. Yeah. But if you have something that you can start sharing, whatever you have right now, then we can add additional and that would be good. Sure. Uh, let me see. I've got, in terms of fiscal year 21, uh, this would be from the fall of 2020 and estimated amounts for the spring of 2020. Uh, we've got contract labor, production and research, was 367,000, outdoor media was 658,000, radio media was 803,000, print media was 140,000, digital and social media was 30,000, 
and the breakdown in terms of the outdoor media, the out, uh, outdoor advertising. I've got a borough breakdown. It was 13% in Brooklyn, 20% in the Bronx, 29% in Manhattan, 18% in Queens, and 19% in Staten Island. But again, if there are other details you're interested in, uh, Rebecca can get you the whatever further information you you're like. Look, you're looking for an ethnic media breakdown. And we'll, we'll follow up. Oh, I'm you sorry. I didn't, I didn't hear ethnic. Oh, so you want to know? Oh, yeah, we can certainly get you that. There's a big problem that we inherit in New York City Commission. Yeah. Again, it's not you, it's not me, but we need to break the ceiling, break the wall, and address it. Absolutely. Our ethnic media. It is, and again, I think that with the executive order that the mayor put in place, which is one of the best, the first time that we have in New York City that mandate this agency to invest, I think it's 30% of the advertising and media. It's a big change right now because sometimes all agencies think that if they cover it, and I advocate in this case on the, on the Latino piece, if they put it on Univision, Telemundo, and Diario, and two other one is covered. And we have a big entity that is getting most of the advertising. Uh, that for the 11 year, they, that person is the one winning all the IFP, million dollars. And when you look about any media, people who read those local newspapers, who see those local watch TV, zero commissioning in my district. Ah. And okay, well, we... Many times over and over, I have talked to your team and the answer is we look at it, but they have never come back to say, let's put a conversation with five or 10 of the local one so that we can connect them with that opportunity. So with Rebecca and the team, whatever we can look at it, I can tell you the answer will be in most of the agri media is zero investment. Okay. Yeah. We will, we will absolutely make that a priority, uh, Chair Rodriguez, and I and I appreciate I appreciate you bringing that to our attention and making sure we do. And and doesn't again doesn't mean it's you. We have a big issue right now, and again, the only mayor that has made executive order mandating that is Mayor De Blasio. I give a lot of credit, but from his decision to where the money is going, there's a big gap. And there's some people taking advantage and it's very easy to make those numbers. So let's hopefully yeah. can work. Can work Ab abs absolutely. Uh, we will, we will figure out why. Um, yeah. I mean, the numbers, the numbers I was shown show an investment, but if it's not reaching your district and people aren't aware of it, then it's obviously something yeah. we need to pay attention to. So we will. Only my district yeah, as, as we live in the 21th century, yeah. And there, there's, as you know, 35% of New York is more than 35% of New York is has been born and raised in another country. Yep. And vision that they, they, that the Ecuadorian, the Colombian, the Dominican, the Puerto Rican, that they watch, that they are in the media. There's people that are doing TV for since before I arrived in 1983. Yep. No one is approaching those local media to say, how can we also connect, you know, with those individuals who follow your program, who pay taxes, also to have that opportunity to uh, be connected with agents. But again, uh, thank you for you know being open, and I will definitely welcome to be following following up with your team. Absolutely, thank you. Five hole repairs. Uh, uh, how can we look at that? Partially as the pandemic, the average time to close a five hole work, order improve from 2.5 in the first four months of fiscal 2021, compared to the same period last year, according to the PMR, DOT repaired, repaired 27,920 power in the first four months of fiscal 2021. How much funding does DOT allocate toward power repair how many potholes does the department plan to fix this year and how many were done last year? Okay, um, we have allocated over 25 million for this, for this fiscal year. Um, 
you know, we respond to pothole demand. Uh, so the number is not, is not fixed. It's a response to the demand. Uh, and it's driven by various factors, obviously the weather, freeze thaw cycles, wear and tear on the pav pavement and the state of the roadway to begin with, whether there was long-term capital investment. Um, we are also working to minimize the response time on potholes. We have a program underway to try and do that. And as the spring, I hope may be approaching, we are gearing up for pothole season. And again, we're happy to, we're happy to, we do keep track of pothole repairs. We do have the numbers on an ongoing way, uh, basis and we prioritize uh, roadways with chronic potholes for resurfacing. And again, we're happy to provide a report in, you know, to reply, reply data, provide data in whatever form um, you would find useful as we make our progress uh, through the spring. Uh, do you have any, uh, as you look for, for $25 million for 2022, uh, do you have also the numbers of how many potholes were uh, repaired in 2021? Uh, the first four months of fiscal 2021, I do have a number. It was 27,920 potholes. Okay, okay so let, let's continue sharing again whatever more data because, as you know, even though it looks as something simple, this is one of the things that you know, all New Yorkers are looking. You know, okay. pothole, uh, repeat, uh, repeat offenders. Uh, where do we have to focus more and, and the type of materials that are used in order to be sure that, you know, those pothole they don't come back is the remote, even though we know that many of them is impacted by the web. Absolutely. The MQBE percentage. Can you, uh, can you provide the committee with the minority and women uh, opportunity Percentage for DOT contracts for fiscal 2020 and for fiscal 2021? Uh, yes, let me find. Whoop. They're in my notes. Let me find them. Sorry, give me one moment. I know I saw it in here. Thanks. Okay, so for fiscal year uh, 20, contracts by ethnicity, uh, a total of 331 uh, MWBE contracts, of which 27 were awarded to black owned businesses, 65 Hispanic, 165 Caucasian female and 74 Asian. I also have the dollar amounts. Uh, and then in fiscal year 21, uh, we've got 152 contracts, 10 to black owned businesses, 26 to Hispanic, 33 to Caucasian female and 83 to Asian. And I have the dollar amounts as well uh, if you'd like, we could provide that to your office. If you can provide. And, or, and again, or, or, yeah. That's one area that also we're looking to see how we can make improvements. Uh, Absolutely. Do you, by any chance, uh, have those uh, numbers of those who got those contracts also by their address so that you can also share with us uh, where are those entities located? Based by the C code and, and, and community board and and, and council. Yeah, I don't have that. I don't have that data handy, but we can certainly look into it. And as to the priority, Chair Rodriguez, and I think you and I may have discussed this as we were out in the cold in the Bronx. This this for for us is a very high priority. This is something. I've only been here a few weeks. We've already had a number of meetings on this subject, exploring what we're doing and what we can do better. And this is certainly a priority, obviously for the mayor and for this department as well. So 
we, I, we'll get you we'll get you the data and it's something that we we realize we need to do better on i take your word i take your commitment we are against the clock and, and i can tell you again everything is local yeah. i don't i don't have one person as you know i i can say that for me teacher as a grass organizer i know a lot of people in my community i had not met one person that had come to me in this place that has said I am many, I have many who are uh, women and minority certified. I have not met anyone from my community that said, I've been able, I applied, I went to this workshop, and I was selected as one of those uh, who the database we built. Neither with many, many city agents. So hopefully, more than happy to be working with you and your team. Yeah, but we have a. We have a good group working on it, and I know that they're trying lots of innovative things. But again, if you've got suggestions, we're happy to hear them. So, how do you feel? I asked two or three questions before I out. Before my colleague, how do you? How are we doing as today when it comes to crashes, either storm, at this moment, big DOT? the agency that is leading Vision Zero. Like, how are we doing today compared in, in these months, this year, compared by 2021? Okay, uh, I again, you were breaking up a bit. Were you asking about the results? Uh, I've got the numbers. I've got the numbers as of yesterday. Um, uh, year to date, uh, I mean, and again, all of these numbers are too high because they aren't zero. The point of vision zero is zero. Uh, 19 pedestrians, one cyclist, no motorcyclists, 10 motor vehicle occupants, and one other motorized person for a to uh, uh, vehicle for a total of 31 uh, compared to this time in 2020. It's five fewer pedestrians, uh, the same on bicycles, uh, and overall eight fewer. Um, so those, those are the numbers. Uh, compared to 2013, when the program started, it's 18 fewer pedestrians, one fewer uh, cyclist, and 24 fewer people overall. So obviously the program has has been a success and it's i mean a, a a success so far still we need to make it better zero zero but the program's been a success and we've made great progress since 2013 2020 was a challenging year uh, but we're committed to getting back on track and moving in a positive direction for 2021 okay commissioner as you know the council with is working with a bill that I need Lee Prime together with Speaker Johnson and Council Member Lander that is working very hard and committed to transfer uh, the coalition investigation squad unit from NYPD to DOT. And even I got a call, you know, from a reporter who said that in conversation with the speaker, he said that the council will use the power to override if it's needed. I don't think that we need to get there. I feel that this is something that uh, I hope that we can work together, the council and this administration. Uh, uh, I feel two things with that, is that at no moment this bill is speaking about putting DOT to do criminal investigation. That's not DOT expertise. That's not what we expect. So at no moment the bill is making those changes. What the bill is speaking is the coalition investigation squad unit should be coordinated or co-coordinated by DOT. Since the agency in this particular case, you are the commissioner, will be the one that have, well, we have all the expectation that will be leading all the work related to Vision Zero. If and when we pass this bill, again, 
it will not have impact on the criminal investigation because that will be under the NYPD. We are not speaking for DOT to hire a DOT staff to now add it to that unit. In the, my way, the same many women in that unit, they should be transferred and they should have their coordination, they coordinator, a police officer that will be conducting all the investigation. If we pass that unit to DOT, how do you think that it will have an impact in the budget of the agency? Um, I think, well, again, uh, I look forward to working with the council on the details of the bill. And it sounds like, um, it sounds like it's changed since um, the last exposure. Uh, as to the impact on the budget, that would depend on what, what we were asked to do. And I don't, I don't have those numbers sitting here. Um, I can say we have a shared objective of making sure that, that, uh, that the crashes are thoroughly investigated and that whatever safety measures are taken. And obviously the police are the people to do the criminal the criminal investigation, as the DA's letter said, because they are the people who know how to do that. We don't have that expertise in the agency. But in terms of our agency working closely with the police to make sure that we learn from whatever their investigation uncovers and we make use of that in improving vision zero and changing streets if they're unsafe and all of that, absolutely. As to the mechanics of how that works, um, you know, as I said, we're, we're happy to work with, obviously, with our partners in the police department and with the council on, on coming up with what's best. And as to the budgetary impact, I think that would depend on, on what, what the legislation ultimately looked like. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, uh, Thank you. Goldman, now let's go back to my colleagues that they have question. Uh, you will hear from uh, Elio on the direction. And I know that we have council member Lander Miller, but I will turn it back to uh, Elio to give direction on who will be now asking questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we'll now call on council members in the order that they've used the Zoom raise hand function. Um, council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will let you know when your time is up. Um, council member Miller will be first, um, followed by council member Lander. Council member Miller. Time starts now. Thank you so very much. And, and Mr. Chair, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for certainly acknowledging our uh, essential and frontline workers, particularly those in the transportation industry that, that keep us moving and, 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 and having an opportunity to memorialize them. Uh, good morning, Commissioner, and, and, and welcome uh, to your first budget hearing. Morning. Um, while, while we know that DOT uh, uh, is, uh, as an agency has grown by 10% uh, since fiscal year 10, uh, 2019. Are you able to provide us with a breakdown of where uh, we can find the largest impact in this uh, uh, enhancement in your, in your budget and, and their programs? Similarly, the department's headcount has grown by 500 since 2019. Uh, could you provide a breakdown as to where um, they are as well? Um, and then, so that, that is if I would kind of want to get through the questions, um, the agency plans to install 720 speed cameras by this year, uh, funded uh, uh, $81 million capital budget. Are you able to provide a breakdown by community boards uh, where these cameras are installed? Uh, we've had uh, a, a great deal of concern in the outer borough, but not just the outer borough, but in communities of color on how DOT uh, investments are, are made, uh, particularly around Vision Zero. Uh, it is our contention that we often get speed cameras while other communities get major investment in sidewalk uh, and, and other infrastructure that, that supports uh, safety. And so we've had a difficult time in terms of transparency, identifying um, where this work is being done, where the investment is being done. Uh, we have seen throughout the years that budget hearings in the outer borough communities, uh, that CURBS contract program is falling woefully short. Uh, for homeowners, 
Um, this is a big deal. And, and you talked about how uh, lives are touched throughout the city. Um, we have homeowners that, that are fined by the DOT and forced to repair sidewalks. And meanwhile, uh, the city is responsible for the curves and they have no curves. Um, the, the curb program, uh, we've been writing, we've been asking over the past few years. I have constituents that call the office, you know, all the time because of the ponding that occurs because they have no curves. Um, or do we anticipate um, that there will be an investment uh, in uh, a large investment in the curb program? And then finally, the Pedway program, when do we anticipate that that will end and will those, that workforce transition over to be able to do some of the sidewalk and curb work um, that is needed in the outer boroughs. And, and, and uh, I will also say, I'd be remiss because I, I, I know that the chairs uh, talked about MWBE uh, participation and the lack thereof. Uh, I, I, I think that it stops, starts at the top and we need more diversity in senior leadership, certainly. And you know that uh, when you walked in the room there, uh, we've been, uh, having this conversation for the past eight years. And I think the leadership really reflects the values of the community that they deserve. So I'll just fall back and allow you to answer those questions. Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, and thank you for the questions, Council Member Miller. Um, uh, in, in terms of diversity within the agency at the top and including at the top, absolutely, absolutely we agree. And that's something that we're working on and again, we've got a good group of people working on it, uh, but obviously we, we have more work to do. Um, uh, and uh, you and I, I believe, are scheduled to get together later this month. And I'm hoping that we can have a good conversation in which you can ask specific questions that you would like us to address. And I will represent to you that we will. As to some of the specific questions you asked uh, concerning numbers, et cetera, now uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Executive Deputy uh, uh, Jaron to respond to those because I believe he's got the numbers. I could tell you how many cameras we have. I couldn't tell you the details that you're asking for now. Okay. So let me, let me throw it to him. Can somebody take Joe off mute? You're still on mute, Joe. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. I, I, okay, um, Council Member Miller, I wanted to start with your Thank first you question, all. if that's okay, in, in the growth in our budget. As you, you mentioned, our, our budget has grown quite a bit. Um, and I can, I can tell you the, the major components of that um, have been, Definitely, you know, when the mayor started with Vision Zero being a priority, um, $58 million overall has been added to our, our annual operating budget. So that's a big piece of what you've seen as the increase for DOT um, over these last uh, many years. Uh, another big part of Vision Zero has been, and that, that's just Vision Zero for street work and, and, and other components of Vision Zero. Just looking at the camera portion of Vision Zero, camera expansion, that's been $80 million of growth in our, in our annual operating budget, uh, going directly to the camera program uh, for our bus initiatives is close to $10 million per year that our, our budget has grown uh, under the de Blasio administration for 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 the bus per initiatives and as a you mean, I think you may know uh, our accessibility program has expanded quite a bit. We now have a, a, a substantial uh, uh, size of crews uh, performing pedestrian ramp upgrades on the sidewalks, on the, on the curbs and, and the corners. That's about 40, $45 million of annual uh, growth in our budget for that. So those items really make up the, the chunk of what you've seen in our, in our growth and headcount. We've had uh, over, you know, as, as you've noted, hundreds of positions added to our headcount. So much of that is for those, those initiatives I just mentioned. We can give you a detailed breakdown if, if you like uh, on that. Could you do it also uh, in terms of investment by community boards and what those investments look like? We have absolutely uh, been an, uh, evaluating uh, that, and we, we can provide uh, certainly for the Division Zero programs that are geographic in nature. Uh, that that's, that certainly we, we can provide. Uh, transparency is, is a bit of an issue. You know, we've actually had to foil some of this information 
as well. We hope to have it available on, on real time on a website, but to see where the investment actually is going. It is the belief that in communities of color, um, it is more punitive and that we get red light cameras and not the type of investment that really keep people safe. And, and so we, we want to be able to disaggregate that by real data. And I, and I hope that we're wrong in, 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 in the lack of investment. Um, but we just, you know, if, if you could tell us that. And then finally, um, I, 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 like my constituency homeowners are really interested in, in curbs and sidewalks and, 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 and street ponding and, and stuff like that. Um, but we, we're not like that, that program is almost non-existent. Understood. Uh, and I believe, uh, Commissioner, uh, with our meeting coming up with the council member, we, we can certainly um, provide uh, some of the particular pieces of info that you're looking for there. Uh, and and uh, we'll follow up separately as well. Right. Absolutely. And how could we be helpful, right? And obviously, you know, you know, 75% of the city rents don't talk about homeowners and curbs. How could we be supportive and, and, and helpful and, and bring that? So we just don't want, you know, we want, we, we want to be allies and partners. And Councilmember Miller, I think you've been doing that with the, the conversation that you had with Deputy Commissioner Hayward and Associate Commissioner Howard uh, recently, and you prioritize locations and we've been clipping through them. And I think that is, has been a tremendously helpful dialogue between us and, and the, the sidewalk division. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. Um, Thank you. Next, we will hear from Councilmember Lander, who will be followed by Councilmember Deutsch. Councilmember Lander. Time starts now. Thank you so much, Chair. Commissioner Gutman, welcome. It's really wonderful to see you. You and I have a, a long history of working together, and I look forward to working with you in this new role. And I really appreciate what you said about the, your, uh, your, your misstatement becoming a true statement about the Department of Transformation. This is a moment to transform our city in ways that make it safer and more livable and get past what I think have been some of the kind of, I don't know, culture war versions of these critical safety and livable cities Right. So I appreciate that energy you're bringing to it. This is an important moment to, to move forward. Um, I want to start my questions uh, with the dangerous vehicle abatement program. Uh, as you said in your testimony, um, you know, we've just seen the, the growing number of deaths on our streets is tragic. We had one right here in, in my district last week, you know, and, and we're on path to have the most deadly year in a long time. So we need to keep ramping up the work for safety. And one of those things is implementing the program to combat reckless driving by identifying the very most right. reckless drivers. I know the program is not in the preliminary budget, but I appreciated the announcement that you and City Hall made last week or the week before um, that there's a plan to move, you know, move forward with it. So I wonder, you know, can you confirm that it's your understanding as well that City Hall, City Hall is going to put it in the executive budget and what's the timeline for moving forward with the program? So again, I'm happy, well, Thank you for the welcome, and I too look forward to working with you in, in this new capacity. And um, the, the answer is that I can confirm that we are proceeding with this, and I believe the mayor has announced and uh, the DOT is absolutely on board with the proposition that we'll have the classes for those who require them under the program up and running by the fall. So no, we are we are we are all in. This is on our list of things to get done this year. And um, yeah, no, we are on exactly the same page there. Thank you. I'm, you know, when it was canceled for the pandemic, of course, I understood, but I worried that it wouldn't get done during this administration. And so moving forward to get it done this year and rolled out during this administration, I think is a really significant step forward. Um, another question about the budget. Uh, I've been seeing more bike racks go up around the city. But I, I was some advocates told me that money that you're running out of bike racks and that there's no new money in the budget to buy more that you've got maybe 3000 on hand, but the mayor pledged to put 10,000 more in. Is there money in the budget for the to, to meet the mayor's bike racks commitment or is that something we need to get added in exec. Well, let, let, let's put it this way we have ongoing we, we, we have every intention and the mayor has expressed his commitment to honoring the commitments that he made in the state of the city. And that additional one, which we made together uh, the day that my appointment was announced, and we are in an ongoing process with City Hall and OMB to make sure that we've got funding for all of them. Um, your support is obviously helpful 
Uh, but we're, we are working on, on all of those issues with City Hall and OMB. Uh, and and look, we're optimistic. It's a lot we're of commitments, and that's great. Green Wave made a lot of new commitments. You've made a lot. You know, that's not only things like bike racks, that's getting the inspectors out on bicycles to monitor the bike lanes and doing traffic calming at the intersections and on buses as well, uh, more enforcement of bus lanes. So I, I, I want to make sure that you, got, you have the resources you need to, to do all those things. And, and I appreciate, we all appreciate the sentiment and we are working on that, as I said, with City Hall and OMB and are, are optimistic that we will have the money available to satisfy our commitments. Um, okay, just, and I, you know, but to underline, like optimistic that we will get it added in the executive budget. Like that sounds like you're saying, you know, I'm being a good new commissioner, um, but I need some more in the executive budget if I'm going to meet all the commitments that the mayor has made. And I, you're a brand new commissioner. I don't want to get you in trouble in your first month, um, but I do want to make sure you have the resource, a big agency. I want to make sure you have the resources that you need to, to meet them. No, and, and we certainly appreciate that sentiment and that support. Um, as you can imagine, at this point, there are a lot of moving pieces, and that's that's the reason that my answer is as it is. I mean, we're well, I, we're, I we're confident it, but... we're confident we'll be that we'll figure this out. And... Okay, well, I'm glad for your confidence, but we're going to push hard to make sure that more resources are put in the DOT budget. You know, the fact that we're getting six billion instead of four billion in in American Rescue Plan funds, we've got to make hard choices, but they can't be choices that put people at risk on our streets. Um, I have a couple Agreed. more questions and I see my time is almost up. Mr. Chair, I'm happy to come back in a second round or can I have one more minute? You can have, you can have it, bro. Okay, great, you thank you so much. All right, two more questions then. Um, one, uh, one more citywide question is about um, the, the pedestrianized streets program, the open streets programs. Um, you know, I've been such a big fan. Open Restaurants has been uh, tremendous. I fought hard for it. And I'm grateful that DOT did the work for Open Streets for Schools. Open Culture is going to make a big difference. On the basic Open Streets program, uh, I do want to ask a little what we're learning about how to win equity in that program. It's my perception, and DOT was right about this at the beginning, that stewardship is just critical, that if you don't have a group to help take care of it, then the odds that the barrier gets hit by a car and starts to collapse and then the whole thing kind of we've, we've seen that on a lot of streets so what are we learning in terms of implementing that program in a way that kind of learns some of the lessons from the spring um, and invests in thoughtful approaches to maintenance partners with a special eye toward having as that program becomes longer term that it's really equitable in neighborhoods across the city yeah i mean that's a very good question and and the answer is that, as you've observed, um, in situations where you don't have local sponsors, for example, a local bid that can assume the maintenance responsibilities, we need to find some alternative. And we're working hard at doing that. I think um, part of the inquiry is getting a sense of where the streets are popular, where they're successful. I mean, some have been more successful than others. Some have been more popular in the local communities. So, so part of the equity initiative is figuring out, is not assuming one size fits all, but figuring out what works in each of the particular communities with, with special focus on underserved communities. Because, I mean, because that's what, that's what it's all about. That's what equity requires. And, and to the extent that one needs help in providing the stewardship, uh, we are looking for creative ways to do that. Um, but again, all of that's easier if it's if there's community support and there's popular support for doing whatever it is in a particular location. That just makes all of this easier. Absolutely. I would uh, uh, urge you to look back at the neighborhood plaza program, which invested right. resources in nonprofit and partner stewardship of plazas and made a big difference in making it possible uh, for communities that would not have otherwise had a bid or a volunteer resource partner as one way of maybe building on that. All right, my final question is a district issue. Um, DOT is planning to install a two-way protected bike lane on Parkside Avenue, but a segment of the lane near Park Circle is slated only to be six feet wide, contained by the barrier and the curve. And it's like, that's half the width of what NACTO says we need for two-way bikeways and just doesn't feel sufficiently 
uh, safe. It's going to be at least eight feet the rest of the space. But um, uh, what can we do to make sure that we get a lane that's not too narrow for genuine two-way two-way bike traffic there? Well, I, th I think I think you've done it by raising the issue. We will we will talk to. I will raise this. This is now on my to-do list, and I will raise this with the appropriate people who are designing it. Uh, and we will do our best to address the issue. And again, as, as with all these issues, and this is an invitation to, to all the council members on the call, um, we count on you to be eyes and ears in your districts and to report situations that we need to know about. And uh, that's great. Thank this, you. And, and I feel that, you know, this was not like a time to visit gotcha question. I just heard about this over the weekend. So it sure. seemed like knowing that you would be here would be a good opportunity to ask, but I will look forward to following up offline. Um, and I really appreciate your willingness to, to look into it. Um, and we'll keep raising our voices to make sure that what's in the executive budget provides the resources for the ambitious transformation that you, that you have planned. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we were joined by Councilmembers Levine and Yeager. Um, our next Councilmember we will hear from is Councilmember Deutsch. Councilmember Deutsch. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, good afternoon. I'd like to good know. Afternoon. Good afternoon. I'd like to know how uh, the city um, is responding to ponding conditions. Um, based on the budget, is is that something that you're keeping up with? The, I'm talking about major. Pond. We all know that when uh, for the city to say that you know for the, for the city to come back to say okay, this is a, a serious ponding issue. Um, water has to like literally sit there for one in like I think seven days. So how is the city responding to these major ponding conditions, um, and if the budget has an effect in it? Um, we've. Uh, we certainly have money in the budget to address these kinds of street and sidewalk maintenance issues. Um, uh, if you have specific examples where you'd like us to look, I'd be happy to pass that on to the team. Um, yes, I have, uh, I, I have in my district, I have three major ponding conditions that has, that has been ongoing for probably now, um, I called it like two and a half years ago. And uh, I've, I've been trying to be the eyes and ears for DOT. And um, I've been not getting any results on all three conditions. And two of them at a crosswalks when we talk about vision zero or people need to cross the streets. And I'd like to know if I could get a commitment for someone to come out there like as soon as possible and see if we could correct that. Um, I believe DOT has those three locations already. And I could re-email them as soon as we get off. But I want to make sure that when the city does come back and deem something a uh, ponding condition, that it must be corrected. There shouldn't be any excuses uh, not to repair those conditions, no matter how you difficult know, it may be. You go ahead, I, Rebecca. I can Rebecca, follow, you... hi, hi, council member. It's, it's, it's been a long time. It's nice to see you. I. I'm, I'm assuming that the Brooklyn office has it, and if they're if they've been long-standing issues, I'm guessing that one of the things that we've said in the past is that capital reconstruction is something that would be needed. But can you let me follow up with Keith and see what the latest is that he has on on those, and then our, our offices can follow up with yours or Tova. Okay, I appreciate it because I just want to I just want to mention one more thing. And for the last several hearings, I've been bringing this up, and um, I've been. Being, I was told that it's in the Brooklyn office and they're going to follow up. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, if Apologies. it was in your office, if it's in your office, Rebecca, I know you follow up, but I want to make sure that it gets followed up and that it gets taken care of. This way I don't have to come to I'll the follow next up, hearing. I'll follow up with Keith today. Okay, uh, and great. apologies, I, I, I didn't recall you bringing up in past hearings, but I, I'll follow up with Keith and Claudette today. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, at this time, are there any other council members that would like to ask a question of the DOT? Okay. Um, oh, council member Holden would like to ask a question. Um, council member Holden. Time starts now. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for your testimony. 
uh, and uh, welcome to the first budget hearing. Uh, Thank I you. Just, uh, I have a few questions, not not too much. Um, uh, I, I had trouble this past actually two years. Um, for instance, the bus lanes, when they were put in on Woodhaven Boulevard, there were several errors that um, were made, especially on corners where there was no turning for the cars, the dotted lines weren't there to, to, to indicate where they could start to turn. And as a result, it caused um, a lot of problems, not only uh, dangerous conditions, but accidents happened at these corners because people were cutting in at different times. Um, and, and there were a host of other things like when DOT made a mistake in turning lanes, we couldn't get them corrected for sometimes six months to a year. And um, I'm wondering if in the budget, um, it, or is could there be a special unit to correct errors that are made in markings? Because it actually lingers so long and causes so much, not only congestion, but pollution over you know, a, a period of eight to 10 months I've seen. Um, and and I, my second part of my question is, um, I've had a number, you know, I just like to know the cost uh, of a traffic, installation of a traffic light, uh, because uh, for some reason we're getting a lot of traffic lights installed very quickly and many of them and in fact, I, I notified the uh, previous commissioner about um, the mistakes they make in determining um, where the traffic light should go. Many times they're put on the wrong corner. Can you address the, the cost of uh, installing a traffic light in New York City? Uh, sadly, that's, that's a number I don't have at my fingertips, but I, I suspect that uh, Mr. Jaron might. So if I could okay. ask him, if not, we can certainly get it for you. Joe? He's on mute. Uh, Commissioner, I, I, I want to get you that number. I, I, it will depend on, on whether it's a, a full capital re, uh, installation or a more minor type of installation. Uh, there's a range of what the cost might be, but um, if, if we can get well, back no. to that. Yeah, well, why not? I, why not perhaps I heard, we can, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I heard it was between a quarter of a million and a half a million. Um, dollars per installation. Is that is that like a reasonable? It, it, that is a reasonable expectation, yeah. particularly when there's obstructions that we have to um, move other infrastructure on on the on the sidewalk to 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 uh, to install it. So that that's what can make and, it very and expensive. There seems to be there seems to be no rhyme or reason because I just had a couple installed that were that didn't quite make sense. I had three. And actually, three lights installed within a four-block area um, near a park, um, and it didn't. You know, I, I understand one of them, but the other two didn't make any sense. And I never got an explanation. Each time I asked, "What was the criteria for installing this?" Um, well, we got a request, and it went through. But I never get. Uh, I, I checked with the precinct about the accident report. It, there were really no accidents, so. I'm just concerned that we're throwing money away sometimes on unnecessary traffic lights, which, uh, which I've observed on residential streets, cars seem to speed up when the lights turns yellow. Everybody knows in New York City that's happening. I mean, everybody could admit to that, that when the light starts to change, a, a motor vehicle will speed up. And that's kind of very dangerous on a residential street. So. No, um, I could talk to the Queen's office because they should be able to provide you with some volume and crash data that we use because it's obvious. I mean, we, we use it an incredibly, you know, it's a federally mandated data driven approach to where signals go. So if, um, you know, if you need more details on some specific recent installations, I can talk to the Queen's office about about getting you kind of clear data on that. Right. If you, so, Commissioner, if you could just... Uh, reply to the question about when mistakes are made in marking, street markings, why does it take so long uh, to correct it? Um, having been here for just a month, uh, I, I, can't, I can't speak to the history, but I can tell you that when we conclude this hearing, I will ask appropriate questions. And again, you know, if you bring things to our attention, uh, I can't speak to the past, but I, uh, I can say that we will we will respond and we will try and find out an answer, and if in fact it's a mistake, we will we will deal with it promptly. 
I mean, yeah, I, I certainly understand the concern. I understand the concern for sure. Yeah, when you have, you know, you have the bus lanes put in, there should be, I mean, it's not rocket science, right? It's, you I know, agree. at the corner, you have the dotted lines where the cars can break into the lane. And I still have mistakes that haven't been corrected. And I shouldn't have to point it out. There should be a team that goes out, inspects it, look, says, okay, here's a mistake. I had to document it in video. I had to show the accidents that happened there. And still, DOT Queens did not correct it. Now I was ready, ready to go out with a black, uh, some black paint and paint the uh, dotted lines. I was joking, but I said, "What does it take?" I made a video about it. Um, it just seems, and when they when they mixed up uh, a turning lane, they they made it opposite. Um, again, it wasn't corrected for probably uh, almost a year. And that, again, caused traffic jams. And yeah. so I, I think I, we need a budget set aside for mistakes where <laughs> they, could, they could correct it so we don't have, they, they didn't make it worse. And just another thing, three years waiting for speed bumps is totally, totally ridiculous. Uh, and I did on 76th Street in Woodhaven. I complained a long time. It was finally installed um, a few months ago. But I, I put, this, uh, I put the uh, speed bumps in in November of 2017, the community board approved it, I, I guess, in that following spring uh, of 2018. And we just got them installed now on a very, on a street that had a lot of accidents, side swipes, because it was very narrow. Right. And I just, I, I just think we need to, you know, put safety on the fast track and not back it up to years and years of people waiting. Thanks, uh, Commissioner. I, 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 Thank I, I, I agree. I, yeah, and th thank you for raising the point. We will certainly okay. pursue it. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Holden. Um, our next council member will be Councilmember Rose. Councilmember Rose. Time, time starts now. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner, and, and welcome. Uh, I look you. forward to having a meeting with you specifically about Staten Island issues. But um, Absolutely. I noticed in the budget that there's a reduction in ferry administration and surface transit. Um, what and where are these re reductions? Uh, what's the impact? And uh, just what are these reductions? Uh, again, you, if you I... mean MTA reductions in bus uh, service? Well, no, it says um, under under this budget, it says DOT ferry administration oh, and surface. Apologies. Oh, um, I can I can answer that. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Jaron has the details. Uh, it, we had we had um, uh, savings from um, from grant fundings that that were were then uh, not following through in the following year. So, in the document you're looking at, Council Member, um, mm -hmm. this is from the January plan that you're looking yes. at. Yes. Uh, uh, we we reflected um, uh, some savings that that we were able to to reduce our expenditures for for ferry administration from one year to the next. So uh, okay. that and okay. and the, the state funding that comes in that that helps pay for our Staten Island ferry program is it, it, as 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 you've I'm sure probably seeing in the state budget, it changes from year to year. So our city budget is continually reacting to that. And, and, and where state funds come in, we're able to reduce city funds accordingly. Okay, so there's not going to be any in, uh, reduction in service or impact or- From or that initiative, or head no. Count, or head count, okay. No, absolutely not. Um, okay. Service is handled uh, completely separately. Okay. And, and, and there's no- there's, I'm sorry. There's no planned service reduction, just to be clear, right. related to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> You'd have a problem if there was. Um, but um, I, I wanted to also ask you about the status of the two Arliss class ferries that, um, you know, that were being built and uh, were almost completed. But because of the hurricane, they were damaged. You know what is the status of that, and when are when can we look forward to them being you know put into service? Uh, we are we are back on track with that. Um, uh, I mean the travel. I mean one problem we had was COVID travel restrictions, 
slowed up our ability to send people down to do the inspections. Uh, but both boats are on track to be delivered this year. Uh, we will keep you posted and you are invited to the launch or whatever, whatever the ceremony is when we put a new ferry into service. I, we will make sure that you uh, have advance notice and we look forward to welcoming you for that event this year. It's on our list before, before, before the administration leaves. This is going to happen. It's so exciting. Okay. Thank you. I was trying to unmute and say thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Ha ha happy to happy to be able to deliver good news. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Rebecca, and the, the whole team. Uh, with this, we're coming to the end of the section of DOT. We're going to be taking a break, and then we're coming back at 1 p.m. with the TOC Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Chair Rodriguez, and thank you to the thank you to the whole committee. Look forward thank to working you. together. Bye bye. Bye bye.
Commissioner Aloisi, um, we'd like to check your audio. Still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, thank you. Wonderful. While we are at it, can we do the Assistant Commissioner Vincent Chin audio as well? Hello, Chuck. Yes. On you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Chair, whenever you're ready. Give me, give me one minute, Daddy, okay? All right, sir, thank you. Okay, one. Okay, I'm ready. We begin, sir. Okay. Welcome back to the hearing of the Committee of Transportation. After listening to the DOT Commissioner and his team, and now we will hear from the Taxi and Limousine Commission as they report on an industry that has been devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Tragically, there was a 66% decline in the number of drivers on the street in December 2020, when compared to 2019 before the pandemic. Taxi and Limousine Commission's proposed fiscal 2022 preliminary budget total 54.7 million. The committee hopes to hear from the commission on the effect of COVID-19 on the taxi industry and how the commission is hoping to protect drivers from the effect coronavirus and how it plans to help the industry recover. I think that, you know, the committee anticipate the hearing uh, that we'll be hearing about how the commission is following through with the council's legislation to help provide a struggling taxi cab drivers with financial help and mental health services. Uh, before, uh, uh, the, before we ask the committee council to go over some, again, uh, recognizing other council members who are here now and to administer the oath to the commissioner, I would like to say that uh, today we heard from uh, the, from Mayor de Blasio uh, about uh, his plan to help uh, those medallion owners 
and it's a struggle and how they can be supported. However, it, we do have a lot of concern about the minimum uh, contribution that is in place based on those $65 million. We will have questions about it to the commissioner. Uh, but as I said before, I recognize the leadership with Major de Blasio, not only in the city of New York, but in the state of New York. Someone that I had the honor to be working with him in his administration for so many years, and that I recognize major contribution that he had made to our city and the state. But definitely we have some concern, we have questions. We are not happy with that average $20,000 that we'll be hoping those medallion owners and definitely commissioner, we will have major question about it. Eh, hoy nosotros ahora vamos a tener a la comisionada de Tax and Limousin Commission, eh, una persona con quien nosotros hemos estado trabajando juntos para escuchar cómo ellos ven el presupuesto que tenemos para el año fiscal que comienza en julio primero hasta junio 30 del año 22, cómo se ha estado ayudando a los taxistas en esta época de la pandemia. And I want to recognize also and give thanks to the commissioner for always being accessible uh, when we had to have any meeting, uh, not only with, among us and our team, but also with some uh, stakeholders of the industry, uh, including some uh, owners and presidents and leaders of different sectors, including the, liberal, the taxi delivery industry. So with that, I uh, give it back to Eddie. Thank you, Chair. At this time, we've been joined by Council Members Miller, Diaz, Riley, and Yeager. Um, I will now call on our panelists from the Taxi and Limousine Commission to testify. Uh, Commissioner and Chair, Aloy Ciaretti and and Assistant Commissioner for Finance and Operations, Vincent Chen. Um, I'll now read the affirmation and then I will call on each of you to confirm your response aloud for the record. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee? and to respond honestly to council member questions. Commissioner Aredia Jarmusha. I do, yes. Assistant Commissioner Chen. I do. Thank you, you may begin your testimony when ready. Hi, uh, good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation and Finance Committee. I am Aloisi Heredia Jarmusha, Commissioner and Chair of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. Thank you for inviting me to attend today's hearing and preview the TLC's fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget. With me today is TLC Assistant Commissioner for Finance and Operations, Vincent Chin. One year ago today, TLC's preliminary budget hearing was the last time I was able to meet in person with members of this committee uh, before many New Yorkers started working from home as a public safety measure. COVID-19 affected TLC licensed drivers, vehicle owners, and businesses in many ways, and these impacts will continue to be felt in 2021. We have been terribly saddened to learn of many licensees who lost their lives or who have lost family and friends during the pandemic. Many TLC staff understand this pain all too well, having also lost family and friends, including our colleagues, David Louie and Mukul Shulka from the licensing division. Since then, the TLC has been focused, like all other city agencies, on our response to COVID-19, supporting our licensees by keeping agency operations running and connecting them with opportunities for income and relief while supporting the city's relief efforts. In the spring of 2020, the TLC adapted to the crisis with remote work, flexible scheduling and social distancing to remain fully operational and maintain critical agency services, such as, listening, uh, such as licensing and inspections. Staff from the TLC's licensing and vehicle inspection facilities continue to serve licensees throughout the worst of the pandemic with over 100,000 vehicles inspected and over 105,000 license applications processed since March 1 of 2020. 
TLC has worked hard to keep operations running smoothly, not only as a matter of public safety, but also to support our licensees as they have tried to continue operations during this unprecedented economic downturn, which has significantly reduced passenger demand. As a part of this support, TLC has focused on providing emergency work opportunities for our licensees, including Get Food NYC, that enabled TLC licensed drivers to deliver millions of meals to homebound and immunocompromised New Yorkers. The program was a vital part of the city's effort to address food insecurity that was made worse by COVID-19, as not only income, but also traditional food distribution networks were disrupted. Through October of 2020, nearly 10,000 TLC licensed drivers earned a total of $40 million delivering meals, millions of meals to homebound New Yorkers. This program involved redeployment of TLC staff from every division who staffed food sites, loaded meals into vehicles, signed up licensees and coordinated payment. Our enforcement officers were a key part of this effort as they continue to serve the city in new ways, not only working at food distribution sites, but also delivering meals themselves to homebound New Yorkers and assisting the sheriff's office with business inspections and staffing checkpoints. Our outreach and communications to licensees and the public have been robust and we have shared key information with licensees about local, state, and federal programs and resources, as well as health information about COVID-19 and public health updates related to masks, COVID, COVID testing, and now vaccines. We have hosted COVID testing events in four boroughs with our Manhattan event scheduled for later this month. I am eternally grateful that TLC licensees are now eligible for COVID vaccination and have been so for several weeks now since February 12. TLC licensed staff are working hard to connect licensees with vaccine appointments and I encourage any licensee, any licensee who is interested to sign up for a vaccine. COVID-19 is still very real and we remain focused on health and safety. We plan to remain focused on our COVID response for as long as it is needed. During the pandemic, uh, the TLC also la launched its Driver Resource Center remotely, which has served over 800 drivers and 500 medallion owners. At the Resource Center, TLC licensees can receive financial counseling, legal assistance, public benefit assistance, and answers to questions about their license or TLC rules. The Resource Center has helped over 800 licensees apply for payroll protection program and eco economic injury disaster loans, unemployment, cash assistance, emergency rent relief, SNAP benefits, and Medicaid. Over 500 licensees have, helped, re have received help to restructure medallion loans, and the Resource Center has helped 45 licensees successfully apply for PPP loans. In total, TLC helped guide our licensees to potentially $1.4 billion in support through federal, state, and local assistance programs. I strongly encourage all licensees to schedule an appointment with the Resource Center through the TLC website or by calling 311 and asking for the TLC Driver Resource Center. We are excited about this important resource and I welcome any council members here to join me for a vital tour, a virtual tour, excuse me, of our offerings at the Resource Center. We look forward to opening the Resource Center in person as soon as it is safe to do so. We have continued to innovate new programs for licensees. In December, we launched a new program called Drive NYC New York or Drive NYC Taxi which connects yellow and green taxi owners with drivers interested in leasing their vehicles. This program is one component of our larger work to modernize and spur innovation in the yellow and green taxi industry. And we look forward to marketing the service to our drivers and owners extensively in 2021. As our city has begun to reopen, it is important to stress that TLC licensed drivers have adhered to COVID-19 protections including mask wearing, social distancing, cleaning of high touch areas and vehicles, and opening windows or otherwise ventilation of vehicles in use. 
To educate the public about these efforts, the TLC launched a public service announcement, an announcement campaign on Link NYC kiosks and social medias and inside of our taxi cabs. We hope that campaign is helping to educate the riding public about safety measures in TLC licensed vehicles, but also remind them of the hard work and efforts of our TLC licensed drivers. Moreover, TLC has continued a key source of income for owners and drivers of accessible vehicles. In 2020, over $20 million in taxi improvement funds were provided to owners and drivers of wheelchair accessible taxis. We look forward to continuing the success of this program, serving TLC licensees, as well as the community of passengers that use wheelchairs. Our accessible dispatch program offers trips in yellow and green wheelchair accessible taxis, and we are grateful for the drivers who have offered this crucial service throughout the pandemic without disruption. Now I would like to preview the TLC's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2022, which is 54.6 million, broken down into 41.6 million in personal services, PS, and 13 million in other than personal services, OT, PS. This budget reflects the ongoing challenge we face as we set our sights on recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. TLC will of course maintain its daily operations as we have throughout the entire pandemic without disruption. Plus, uh, but some crucial or critical goals set forth in prior years, such as recruiting new enforcement cadets will be delayed. Citywide limitations on hiring will also delay our ability to backfill positions that have become vacant. Last year, I explained that TLC's budget had remained flat since the arrival of the apps, while at the same time, the number of vehicles on the road more than doubled. Currently, the TLC's authorized headcount is 578, which is lower than it was in 2014 when the apps began operating at scale. As the industry moves forward toward recovery, TLC will need more headcount and funding to address the struggles of our drivers and to deliver on the city's commitment to help stabilize the industry. On the revenue side, TLC's budget is projected to be 56.5 million in fiscal year 2022. During the pandemic, we have seen revenue collection remain stable for licensing as TLC worked hard to ensure licensee, licensees could stay on the road or return to work as quickly as possible if they took a break. Revenue from inspections and enforcement has been lower than normal as a direct result of the pandemic. Many vehicles were not active during the various points of the pandemic, leading to less inspection revenue, and TLC enforcement efforts were significantly adjusted to assist in several COVID-19 related emergency response operations, as reported in the Mayor's Management Report for fiscal year 2021. In fiscal year 2022, we will continue to monitor revenue collections and work with OMB to make adjustments as needed. Looking forward, I would also like to touch on some of our priorities for the future. This was my first year as commissioner and chair of the TLC, and despite unprecedented economic disruption, I am proud of what the agency was able to accomplish for its licensees, and how throughout this time the TLC has critically examined the future of the industry and begun to better align agency services and structure with the realities of the marketplace. In 2021, TLC is actively planning to transition into a post-COVID world. And while we remain dedicated to public health outreach and support, we also remain engaged with drivers, owners, and businesses that we license. I have been impressed and heartened to see the industry and our staff work together to, convene, to overcome many challenges. And I know this resilient industry and team of passionate civil servants will accomplish great things in the coming year. I have been speaking with licensees daily for the past year, and I'm very excited that TLC has developed new forums for its licensees to interact with our staff. One of these new forums is the BASE Roundtable, a virtual roundtable discussion with car services bases, a forum where TLC enforcement, 
prosecution and licensing divisions can interact with bases in an approachable way to solve the issues and problems that they face. Our first roundtable discussion took place last week. It was focused on bases in Brooklyn and we are scheduling more events for all the other boroughs. I have also convened a taxi working group which has begun developing a strategic plan for the yellow and green industry. This group is focusing on several issues, including improving the passenger and driver experience, supporting innovation uh, in technology, and critically reviewing TLC regulations and policies to ensure innovation can thrive. I look forward to continued engagement with licensees, including with the upcoming livery and black car task force, which we hope will produce effective recommendations for these two sectors vital to many communities throughout New York City. Our goal is to make sure that no one is left behind and that everybody has everybody who currently exists uh, in our industry has a place to thrive. All of you know that the complicated issues of medallion debt have been compounded by COVID-19. This has been an issue of extreme importance for the mayor and for TLC, and I know it has been deeply personal for city council. This is why I'm excited to stand with the mayor to announce the creation of a new taxi owner relief fund. And while some details are still being developed, the new fund will offer real relief to medallion owners who have been most impacted by unsound lending practices, increased competition, and the economic pressures of the pandemic. The fund will offer a long-term zero interest loan of $20,000 to eligible to two medallion owners to use as a down payment on paying down and restructuring their medallion debt. This restructuring will have a multiplier effect in the hundreds of millions of dollars in debt write downs debt forgiveness. Additionally, the fund will make available up to $1,500 per month to make medallion loans payments for uh, as many as six months, um, for as many as six months. I have heard too often from medallion owners that during COVID they have had to choose between paying down medallion debt and paying for the basic necessities for themselves and their families. We want to provide relief as soon as possible, not only to help with their expenses and also to restructure and reduce the amount of debt they face. We will couple this with intensified work uh, by the Driver Resource Center, and I encourage all owners to contact the Resource Center as soon as possible to learn about available benefits, including the federal PPP loans. The application period for the PPP loans will close on March 31, so it is urgent to apply. These low interest loans are another way to help manage immediate expenses and restructure debt. We have formulated the relief plan with three guiding principles. One, it must provide financial relief for medallion owners, the actual owners. It must have the participation of lenders to succeed and it must not undermine the value of the medallion or the industry at large. For this reason, we didn't think it was right, it was the right course to support a plan that requires loan reduction down to a fixed amount. As public officials, we have to be very careful about unintended negative impacts on the industry. We've, we've already, we already have experiences with this or with that, and we need a plan that is both effective and sustainable and that can be implemented immediately. Over the last year, I have heard time and time again that time is of the essence from our medallion owner community. I am excited about the new fund, which re represents a new day for so many medallion owners who struggle with the burden of debt. It is especially important now as we begin to envision a reopened city that we support the industry so that it can be in a place and operating as the economy reopens and passenger demand continues to increase. Again, we don't want anyone to be left behind. As you can see, while it has been a challenging year, there is no doubt that all participants in this industry have stepped up to the challenge by feeding New Yorkers, transporting essential workers, and innovating in a variety of ways. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about TLC's work over the past year. 
I'm, I'm happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. So was you and TLC involved in coming up with the mayor's a relief plan? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So the relief plans we consider we will be based about providing a twenty thousand dollar as one option, and then the second one is a few thousand dollars that will be based on someone helping to some of those monthly payments for six months, right? If the medallion owner needs has is having some liquidity issues after the restructuring has occurred, they will have access to up to nine thousand dollars to help make ends meet if they're unable to meet their new lower monthly payment. Being honest with you, that's the plan that will not fly to those, especially six thousand individual medallion owners. Will they consult in this process? I have no consulted, broker, sorry. No broker, no lenders. Yeah, I personally have been speaking with medallion owners for the last year. I speak with medallion owners pretty much on a daily basis. And what I have heard time and time again is that they don't have enough money to put down to restructure the loans. Um, and, and we're talking about a significant investment. $65 million is a lot of money. Um, and if you, if you consider um, that we are restructuring, and it's not 6,000, but if we are restructuring around 3,200 or 4,000 medallions, and each loan has achieved something in the ballpark of $250,000 in debt forgiveness, so erasing a quarter of a million of debt, that creates a pathway for hundreds of millions of dollars collectively in debt forgiveness. Um, and that's what we're trying to achieve. That's the goal. I've, I've heard that from every single stakeholder um, and from the advocates in this in this industry. Um, and we have to we have to move forward. I think this is a smart way um, to leverage limited city resources. Um, we already have seen thousands of loans restructured, um, and now we want to make sure that those who don't have the ability to come up with twenty thousand dollars. To, to be able to, to facilitate that restructuring so that they can cut their debt, so that they can cut their monthly payments, and so that we can focus on the business of providing for higher transportation to our passengers, to New York City residents, and to our visitors. Commissioner, I don't know, I don't know who City Hall heard from when it comes to the individual medallion owners. All I can tell you is that I've been getting email through email, call from call or individual medallion owners about, about this plan and how they were not consulted. So which leader from the individual medallion owners the city hall consult specifically around this plan? We have been speaking with medallion owners, individual owners. I have personally been speaking with medallion owners on this. I do it through my working group. I do it having one-on-one -on -one conversations with our licensees. And time and time again, our owners are telling us that they're straddled with too much debt, that they need their principal to be reduced, that they need mo lower monthly payments, and that they need better loan options. And this plan that is funded with a significant amount of money at $65 million will help achieve that. Okay. Again, Commissioner, this plan, the, this taxi owner relief fund announced by the mayor consisted with $65 million. We provide hope that it go up to $20,000. And then the second piece is to help them with a monthly payment for six months. I have talked to many individual owners. They will not consult it based on what I heard. And I feel that this doesn't have make any connection with the recommendation that came out from the Yellow Taxi Medallion Task Force. And the father city hall made that announcement without any consultation with the council. When we've been working together, I don't think that it show any good intention of addressing the crisis, both sides, 
city hall and the council together. How many medallion, and again, I know that's my approach, very honest with this. I don't think that, again, this plan is even close to the recommendation that came out from the plan that we presented when we had the hearing and when we had our working group. It, what is the money coming from? This will be from city expense dollars. Where, where specifically? What is this money coming from? It'll come from the city's, uh, the mayor's budget expense dollars that will be facilitated from the city through okay. as a result of stimulus monies. Okay. Can you mention some of the players that represent the individual medallion owner that the city hall uh, have conversation around this particular plan? I have, I have personally spoken with over a hundred medallion owners since my time here and all the owners I have spoken to, and I, I, I am not comfortable um, giving you individual names at a public hearing um, without having first gotten permission from these individual owners to discuss their personal business um, on the record. But I can assure you that um, I have personally spoken with medallion owners and all the medallion owners that I have spoken to have consistently expressed to me that their loans are too high, that they need lower monthly payments, and that they need to reduce the principal amount that is owed. And this plan that we have put forth today will help achieve those three things. Um, if you'd like to have a conversation offline, I'd be delighted to bring all the people that I have spoken to personally over the last year into a conversation with you so that you can have the proof that you are requesting. Oh no, this is not toward you. I expressed it to City Hall this morning when they just called me yes to share with me that they will be making the announcement. I think that this one give this plan this the way how City Hall did it doesn't show respect to the council as a partner, doesn't show respect to the key player that we have working with us for many months in the medallion task force. And I don't think that this announcement by this mayor, the $65 million have anything to do to be close to the recommendation come out from the yellow tax and medallion task force. So this is not toward you. And I think that we have, we do have a leaders that represent, that speak out uh, on behalf of the independent medallion owners. And I'm not asking for anything that is confidential between city hall or any individual. I feel that this plan reflect more conversation between city hall and lenders more than conversation between city hall as an individual medallions owner and the city council. If, if I may, if I may just, I, I would like to clarify on the record that this plan um, is a city led plan um, uh, and that it is not a plan that was developed in consult or consort with any lenders. By no means I say that it's been developed by that. But let me be honest with you. Major de Blasio should not be living in the, the last couple of months. Neither he nor his team. Uh, approaching things in a different way as we've been doing for many years. We are in the middle of the crisis. We have not been able to rescue any medallion. What we have seen is a lot of people losing the medallion. What we have seen before, during, after the pandemic, more medallion, being stopped being in the garage. So unless City Hall is ready to have conversation one on one with all of us, all the stakeholders, I feel that this taxi owner relief fund reflects for me consultation more with lenders than individual medallions owner. And 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 I understand I understand your position and, and I respect you and your and your opinions. And, and all I can do is continue to reassure you that this plan was not developed in consultation with any lenders. This is a driver owner plan. We want to put money into the pockets of our driver owners. We want to write down their debt. We want to ha ensure that they have, um, that they owe less and that they have more manageable monthly payments. Um, this is a solid plan. Um, it will create a pathway to the debt forgiveness that a lot of proposals and other individuals have been 
requiring. Um, and I am happy to facilitate any continued conversation. And we need your collaboration and your partnership uh, for the health of the industry. And so we're, we're be, we'd be very happy to set these one-on-one -on -one meetings. So this, is a, this, is a, this is a time for us to work together. This is I, good. I, I have 11 years at council. That's what I've been doing my whole life. As a member of this committee since I was elected in 2009, and as a chairman of this committee, uh, for the last seven years. So, so uh, however, the way of how this announcement came out doesn't reflect the level of collaboration that we have had with City Hall addressing this crisis. So you just say that this plan came out, you know, from you guys. So you didn't have consultation or lenders. This, this plan was not done in consultation with any lenders. So how do you, how do you know that this plan can work and when lender were not able to share the input or individual medallions owner, if this can work. So first of all, you you know um, that restructurings are are have been you've you you've learned through the medallion um, task force that restructurings are a vital path um, to debt forgiveness, and over the last you know years and and always. Um, restructurings always assist medallion owners. And we know of many lenders over the last year that have written down hundreds of millions of dollars in loans through restructurings. What we have heard time and time again, and what I have heard personally from our medallion owners is that because of COVID-19, because of the low ridership, they are not generating any income and therefore they cannot afford the down payment that is necessary to restructure the loan. And so the $65 million plan will facilitate that so that the medallion owners don't have to worry about stringing $20,000 together so that they don't have to borrow money from their friends and families or, or pick into the little bit that they have left in savings. This is the city, standing by um, the yellow taxi industry, investing mat a material amount and saying, we will help you restructure your loans with these 0% interest um, down payment loans. I'm confident that this will work. I'm gonna pause on this question. Uh, definitely, we have different way interpretation. Uh, and of course, uh, we have never been consulted you don't have, I mean, you mean City Hall to consult us, but neither expect that something came out here the same day that we're holding a hearing where we didn't have any a level of engagement in this conversation. It's something that neither we had to have any role as I'm sure based on the input that I've been getting by a lot of people, a lot of people are not happy with this. What people expect, what the City Hall should be working with some of the recommendation that came out from the Yellow Taxi Medallion Task Force, something that City Hall has not done. It. Uh, Commissioner, what is the TLC, for, uh, 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 how is the TLC dealing with, with those uh, medallion owners who are on the water on, the, on their payment beside this plan that you are announcing today? So over the last year, we have worked very closely with the majority of the lenders to halt Monday, the, the monthly payments. They're called holiday reprieves. And so for the last year, at least since April of 2020, most individual medallion owners who have outstanding debt have not had to pay their monthly um, uh, bill. Um, because there isn't any business and the, and the lenders recognize that. In addition um, to a halt and, and facilitating the halt in some instances, we have worked very closely with our medallion owners through the resource center to provide them access to, um, uh, to PPP loans, to benefits, um, to uh, unemployment benefits, as well as, um, uh, as, as, well as rental assistance. Um, and as you know, we, we had our uh, Get Food program, um, which helped put $40 million into the pockets of our drivers. So the, the, the effort has been significant over the last year. And, and how, many, uh, how many are, uh, are these medallions returned to TLC or any agency or entity? 
What, what do you mean by return? Those medallions that the, that the, that the uh, individual owners cannot maintain. How many of those medallions are returned to TLC, to lenders or the entity? So they're not they're not returns for anybody who's not operating their medallion. They're able or in any time, not just during COVID, they're able to put their license in vehicle storage. So they don't have to give it up. Um, they don't lose it. Uh, they don't have to operate it, and they can save costs on insurance. And we do have medallion owners who have put um, their medallions into storage, um, and that has been a lifeline for many of our owners over the last year. Um, but I am very pleased um, to share that over the last couple of weeks, particularly in the last two weeks, we have seen more medallions out on the road, um, which is indicative of, of recovery um, and that our, our medallion owners, many of them are in a better position to start working again. How many medallions are in storage? Um, I don't have that number in front of me, but I, there, there are probably about four or 5,000 medallions in storage presently. Were those medallions most owned by, by corporation or individual owners? Um, most of the medallions that are in storage are, uh, by, um, the, are by corporations. Um, most of the individual medallions are being operated on the road. And as I said a few minutes ago, we've seen um, nearly a 300% increase over the last couple of weeks. Um, and so we have more medallions on the road every day providing service to our riders. Okay. The recovery we, is underway. I don't know if we will have time to help them. And I think that we've been losing months or years Another word I feel that we have failed to the individual medallions owners. And they have been a specific proposal in the plan to help to rescue them. And we have decided not to do it. My commissioner, uh, uh, going back to the taxi owner relief fund, you say that the money were coming from budget that we have in the city. Is that the source or it is as I believe it was said that this is the $5 million is a stimulus depend. So it depends, what can you explain? What is the source of those money? So the money is- The money If we don't get the stimulus money. The stimulus money, this, this fund um, was announced because uh, as the mayor had, had said over, over time that relief would come as soon as stimulus monies come. And you heard the mayor make a commitment today that $65 million in, in, in debt relief and uh, to facilitate debt forgiveness would be set up in, in the next coming weeks. So this program is proceeding um, and, and we're going to set it up as soon as possible so that we can ensure that drivers and owners um, who, have, um, who are either insolvent or on the path to insolvency have access to money as immediately as possible. Commissioner, before you take this role leading this agency, and that's what I say to on record, it's not toward you. Whatever I say is toward we as a city and the agency as a TLC. For many years, we sold to the in, to the medallion owner, especially my major concerns about the individuals one, that they were the one that had the exclusive right by buying this medallion, advertised by TLC to do pick up, drop out everywhere. We, the city has changed those rules and regulations. How do you pretend that we can bring back the opportunity to the yellow taxi medallion owners to get the numbers of passengers that they need in order to only, only to pay the monthly a, a payment, but also to make the living. Uh, many of them, they use the medallion, as you know, to get a loan to buy the house, to send a kid to college. And something that had a value of $700,000, million dollars, went down to $100,000. So what is the future? Because the things on saying that hope is coming, unless they plan right now, at least, get from the stimulus money, 
250 million dollars, 65 million dollars, we now bring a solution to that industry. 65 million dollars will yield over 400 to 800 million dollars in debt relief. That is exactly what is needed to be written down for these medallions. So you asked me a two-part question. Um, what are we what are we doing? So we have established this fund, which is significant. It's not an insignificant amount of money. $65 million is a lot of money. And that money will be used to facilitate we know the write down. We know about the money with the council is the one who the, the council is the you one asked me a two-part question. And I do, I, but I want to I, interject. I want to interject, letting you know. The council I'm still is the one the, the council is the one who approved the bond, the budget. So we work I'm, with City Hall. So we do the executive budget, but at the end of the day, we know about numbers. Great. And 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 I am not doubting um what you know or your knowledge or your experience. And you know that I am a huge collaborator. And I've enjoyed working with you and I've enjoyed working with the council and I look forward to working together to ensure a vital industry across all segments. Um, and, and if I may respond to your question, I'd like to take the moment now to give you a thorough answer if you if you would like to hear it. Oh yeah. Okay. So as I, as I shared, you, you, you asked me a question about the debt relief program and you asked me a question about what are we doing to be supportive of the industry. Um, again, the 65 million is gonna facilitate hundreds of millions of dollars in debt forgiveness and debt write-offs. That's important and significant and it's something that we can move pretty immediately. Secondly, we have to, we have to couple that with, with better or different enforcement. We have to make sure that we are incubating an ecosystem that is inclusive of all sectors of the for hire industry, for hire transportation industry. Um, we need to regulate in a way um, that acknowledges um, our rules um, and the yellow taxi segment. And that is also recognizing that the black cars and liveries provide vital service across New York City. So we cannot be one dimensional. We have to create a system or we have to improve the system where not only are our passengers receiving the rides that they need, but the men and women who work in this industry, who have been working in this industry for decades, can work. Um, and we will do that together with you through more effective regulation, through better enforcement. And, and we have to level the playing field and we have the power to do that together. City Hall had refused to work around the recommendation that came out from the Yellow Taxi Medallion Task Force before you took over this, this as a commissioner. So again, it's not about one individual. This is about, there's a specific recommendation that came out from the Medallion Task Force that will require much more funding than the $65 million. And of course, yes, we will continue conversation with you, with City Hall, the rest of the team, because what we need is a more aggressive plan, putting more dollars to rescue this industry that unfortunately brought the value medallion from 100,000 close to a million to $100,000 to people that today they are struggling. When we, the city made their own law saying that they were the one that had exclusive right to do pick up and drop off, and we change those laws, we change the numbers of passengers they will have. And based on that, the value of the medallion went down. Now we as a city had to work harder and put more dollars to rescue that industry. With that, now I'm going to go back now to my colleague that has question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, at this time, we'll now call in council members in the order that they use their Zoom raise hand function. Uh, council members, as earlier, please keep your questions to five minutes. Um, at this time, are there any members that have questions for the TLC chair? Okay, Chair Rodriguez, it seems that there are no other members that would like to ask questions at this time. 
So with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Here, we'll now have public testimony.
Hello? We have you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I'm sorry that I didn't know that we had to finish the public session. Okay, we can go ahead and turn the public testimony now, Chair, if that's okay with you. Okay. Should we, should I go back and should you? I, I think we're, we're good to go ahead and get started now. Okay. So, now that we're back on section to finish this hearing with the public and uh, with the public testimony, uh, we go back to our council uh, who will give instruction on the time that each participant have to give the public testimony. If it will take more than two minutes, please summarize. Uh, but if you can do it too great, if it's longer, you can send the reading testimony. And if it take longer, please summarize. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we'll now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. Um, each panelist will have two minutes to speak unless otherwise instructed by the chair. Um, council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. Um, for panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin delivering your testimony. Um, our first panelist will be Amanda Berman. Uh, Amanda? Time starts now. Amanda, you're muted. Hold on one second. Try again. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and esteemed council members. My name is Amanda Berman. I'm the director of the Red Hook Community Justice Center, a program of the Center for Court Innovation. In 2015, the Justice Center launched the Driver Accountability Program. We did this to address vehicular offenses within the criminal court system. The program seeks to improve traffic safety, increase accountability, and provide alternatives to punitive sanctions, such as fines and incarceration. And today, six years later, I'm proud to say that thanks to the support of this council, the program has now served over 2,500 participants across four boroughs. In addition, we've served as a model for the dangerous vehicle abatement program introduced by council member Lander and passed by council last year. In the face of this success, however, we continue to mourn, not only for the lives lost to the pandemic, but for the lives lost to traffic violence. Last year marked the deadliest year on our road since the launch of Vision Zero with at least 244 lives lost. The need for more meaningful, effective and equitable interventions has never been more urgent. And we are therefore respectfully requesting that council continue to support our program in the upcoming fiscal year. The funding would support four critical areas of work. First, it would allow us to sustain our program operations at our existing sites in Bronx, Manhattan, Staten Island and Brooklyn. Second, it would support ongoing research to evaluate programmatic impact. Our existing preliminary findings suggest that the program is effective in reducing risky driving behaviors, but with support from council, we're in the process of completing a full evaluation, which will continue into the next fiscal year. Third, renewal funding would allow us to expand our program into Queens, the only borough we are currently not serving, yet where the need is particularly acute. Traffic fatalities in Queens increased by 22% last year, twice the rate of increase for the city overall. At the Center for Court Innovation, we're well positioned to meet this need. Time expires. Queens. Oh, if I can ask your indulgence and just share one more sentence before I wrap up. Sure, go ahead and conclude. Okay, thank you. Um, lastly, we are hoping to support the expansion um, of our program to address more traumatic crashes on our roads. Um, and so thank you very much for the opportunity to testify and we look forward to working with you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your testimony. Do any council members have questions for Amanda? Okay, um, seeing none, our next panelist will be Ira Mackner. Ira. Time starts now.
There you go. Okay, hi, okay. Hello, my name is Ira Mackner. I am a volunteer at 350 Brooklyn and a resident of Greenpoint. I'm here to advocate for the inclusion of electric school buses into the budget. All facts that I mentioned come from a 2018 study, new school year, same dirty buses from the New York League of Voters Conservation Fund. Just over a hundred years ago, the US first funded school buses nationwide. In doing so, a precedent was set to provide children with safety as they travel to and from school. I remember vividly the vulnerability I felt as a child. Children literally have no choice but to trust the adults around them to preserve their well being. We must stop subjecting their developing respiratory systems to diesel run school buses. Not only does diesel exhaust pollute our environment with damaging greenhouse gases, but some of the exhaust, which is a carcinogen, enters inside of the carriage itself. According to the 2001 NRDC study, the amount of exhaust found inside a bus is four times higher than that of cars. A 2015 study from the Universities of Michigan and Washington showed that after imp implementing the Diesel Admissions Reductions Act in 2005, there was a 16% decrease in lung inflammation of children riding on those retrofitted buses. This study also showed a 20 to 30% decrease in lung inflammation among children already diagnosed with asthma, which as you know, is a prevalent health challenge in New York's underserved neighborhoods. Also school attendance rate increased by 8%. Many see natural gas as the obvious solution. While natural gas has no greenhouse emissions, the process of fracking itself creates damaging emissions and a host of environmental problems, such as volatile pipelines that threaten our wildlife, our soil, and our water supply. Electric buses are the best possible solution. They will not poison our children or the air in the neighborhoods in which they drive. Time expired. Thank you. Thank you for thank your testimony. You. Thank, you. thank you for your leadership and, and your goal and your work around electrical buses is something that is very important also for myself and for everyone at the council. So thank you. Thank you. Could I please have the email again so I can email my testimony? We'll, we'll follow up with you. Okay. Thank you. Um, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Um, seeing none, our next panelist will be Linda Wynn. Linda? Time Hi, starts now. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. My name is Linda Wing, and I'm the Senior Policy and Research Analyst at Align, the Alliance for Greater New York. Align is a longstanding alliance of community, labor, and environmental justice organizations dedicated to creating good jobs, vibrant communities, and an accountable democracy for all New Yorkers. Now more than ever, a year into the pandemic without um, any clear sight, um, we need the city budget to prioritize investments and in job creation for the communities that have been hit hardest from both climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. Within the city's 2022 budget, we're calling for an investment of $3 million towards New York City S-Bus, New York City's municipal school bus, electric school bus program. Um, the $3 million will allow the DOE to expand the current two a vehicle pilot program to approximately 16 additional uh, school buses next year and would support the improvements to necessary charging stations and bus depot infrastructure. Um, as the person um, mentioned earlier today, um, the program expansion allows the city to directly target localized pollution in communities that have been disproportionately impacted by both climate change and COVID-19. Air pollution from New York City's aging fleet of 10,000 diesel and gas school buses creates an unequal burden, especially for students with disabilities, students with respiratory illnesses who are more likely to ride the bus for longer periods of time, and also environmental justice communities where hundreds of diesel buses are housed each day. Let's also remember that Harvard study that came out last year linking communities who are more exposed to fine particulate matter like those coming from air pollution are more likely to die from COVID-19. Electric school buses create zero emissions, can be charged locally using uh, renewable energy sources and can also create high quality manufacturing jobs, which is exactly what our folks need right now, especially during the, the pandemic. As the city looks towards an equitable recovery for all, it must continue the practice of community led transportation planning to identify transit issues and priorities for the most mobility burden New, York, New Yorkers, including clean, resilient and accessible public transportation and street safety. We believe these investments will move New York City on the path towards an equitable recovery for all. Thank you so much. 
Thank you for your testimony. Uh, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, um, before we move on to our next panelist, uh, the, the address to submit written testimony is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, our, our next panelist will be Terry Carta. Terry? Time, time starts now. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Terry Carta and I'm the executive director of Brooklyn Greenway Initiative, a private nonprofit that's been focused for nearly two decades on the development, establishment and long-term stewardship of the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway and a proponent, proponent of our citywide Greenway network of landscaped protected multi-use trails for people of all ages and abilities. Urban greenways create a central public space for human powered transportation and healthful outdoor recreation, provide numerous environmental benefits like stormwater and carbon capture, create jobs and foster active tourism and provide connection to job centers and transit. Greenways offer sustainable low cost mobility by encouraging more people to travel on bike, scooter and other electric and human powered means, significantly reducing greenhouse gas emissions and reliance on personal cars. Greenways are also an opportunity to center frontline community leadership and promote equitable, accessible, and resilient transportation and infrastructure solutions. The relationship between infrastructure and health is undeniable, and the lives of black and brown and low income communities across New York City depend on the infrastructure investment decisions that are made today. It's with this multitude of benefits that I come to you today to call out the absolute essential need for increased capital commitments to closing gaps in our Greenway network in this capital budget cycle. Specifically, BGI asks the New York City Council Committee on Transportation and DOT Commissioner Gutman to advocate and approve necessary capital investments to close these gaps. Currently, Greenways run through every district in the city, but they are rarely connected and therefore cannot deliver benefits equitably or fully. Um, our city needs bold and robust investments in public realm inf infrastructure that will enable all communities to thrive. We need to take a holistic citywide and interagency view. Significant capital investments made by other agencies can't be fully realized until corresponding DOT right of way projects are committed. Time expired. Um, I have one closing sentence um, that support for greenways is overwhelming across age, gender, neighborhood and level of physical activity. Um, and, uh, and emphasize the likely rate of return on a relatively modest level of investment. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, uh, Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you everyone, especially the sergeants, everyone behind the screen, the tech team, uh, all members of the finance, the lawyers and, and my own team as my office. So uh, hopefully we will continue again, having conversation with the issue related to the relief fund that the, was announced today by the mayor, as you heard. I, I don't think that the $65 million is a solution uh, to the crisis, especially when we put a specific recommendation after we spend month working in the yellow taxi medallion task force. With that, this hearing is now is officially adjourned. Thank you.